I had a chance to study Revelation with a professor emeritus, uh, the famous Dr. Merrill Tenney. And he had come out of retirement to do his uh, swan song uh, special course that was his on the book of Revelation. And there were many memorable things about the class. Uh, one was like the first day when he was going through the roster and he called out my name and I said, here. And he looked up and he said, hmm, I wonder where he is and marked me absent. Uh, that was my first clue. My next was when he asked a question about the homework and somebody said, well, it's such and such. He looked up from his lectern and said, well, uh, so we were a class that was in front of somebody who was hearing challenged and it made for a very interesting class. <laughs> but I think one of the things that I've held for all of these years from it is when he gave us a graded exam where we were to draw a picture of heaven. So did you know that there is objective data such that you can draw a picture and get an A, B, C, D, or F? <laughs> well, you know, we do trade in the word heaven like, you know, heavenly chocolate or a heavenly sunset, or we whisper to our kids about the dead goldfish that it would be in heaven, you know, things like that. And uh, we, a joke about the uh, streets of gold, and uh, we imagine them lined with shops that will give us wings and harps and point out our allotted cloud, right? And uh, we always have Peter at the pearly gates. I'm not sure why there isn't anybody else, but that's Peter's station at the pearly gates. And uh, we have, for example, the surgeon who comes up and he says, I'm a surgeon, I saved lots of people's lives, and Peter says, go on in. And the next person says, I'm a hospital social worker. I help many people uh, get back on their feet after their trauma. And Peter says, go on in. The next person says, I'm a hospital insurance administrator. And I help people pay for you know some or most of their insurance bill. And Peter says, OK, well, you can go in. But you can only stay three days. <laughs> So, you know, we, we say things like that, but what do we know beyond just rumor and opinion? What is data that we can mine? And we're actually going to come to a passage today that has data for us. How exciting. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and for your spirit, not only in our hearts, but in our midst. We know that there's a way that we can be more open or less open to you, and we want to be as open as we possibly can this morning to being instructed and inspired, corrected and led. Hear our prayer then, as we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Little review, last book of the Bible for the first Part of the year and it is a visionary poem there are four biographies of Jesus 22 personal letters and a visionary poem this is the visionary poem and when you talk about a visionary poem you trade in symbols and we know all about symbols if you've ever read a political cartoon you know about symbols right there and we begin with it being a revelation of Jesus Christ. That means it is by Jesus Christ and about Jesus Christ. It is not a summons to speculation. It's a call to adoration as we see Jesus Christ. He's the first vision that we get in chapter 1. And there he is the cosmic but close Christ. He holds stars in his hands, so he's cosmic, but he's among the lampstands, these little lights of mine. He's among us, so he's above and among. But he's also a fiery one and a furnace one. His uh, fire in his face and burnished feet. He's also a son of God and son of man. So all of this is right with us as well as over us. And we need both. He's also Alpha and Omega. That is, he's beginning and end. Those are the 
Greek alphabet start and finish letters. And when you think of an alphabet, he's not only at the start and finish, but he makes up every component then <laughs> that makes up every word, every thought, everything. So to be God be the glory in Jesus Christ. Then we move to chapter two and three, the second week, where there were seven letters to seven churches. And we noted that the number seven means complete. So it's for each one of those churches particularly, but it's for all churches inclusively. And we looked as a representative of the seven, instead of working our way through each and every one, we went to the seventh, noting that every one of them has a affirmation, pretty much every one of them, an affirmation, a correction, and a promise. We looked at Laodicea, the most famous. That word makes it even into our American dictionary. Laodicean means lukewarm, because that's where Jesus says, I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I want to spew you out of my mouth. What he means by that is, well, let me ask you gals, do you want a guy who's not sure if he wants to marry you or wants to leave you? He's just always forever someplace where he doesn't quite want to embrace, but he doesn't want to forsake. How does that work for you? It doesn't, it doesn't work for Jesus either. And yet we're sort of that way, sort of a Christian, but sort of not a Christian want to go forward, but don't want to go forward. And this Laodicean dilemma happens with sort of a, a Marlboro man character because they say, you know, thanks for the little help, Jesus, but we got it from here. And uh, you're helpful to us, but you're not vital. And that's something that isn't true and that Jesus needs to speak to and love, and so he does. So that brings us to vision two, chapter four and five. Hear now the word of God. It's gonna go up on the screen, and I say chapters four and five, and I'm gonna read it all, but it's only 25 verses, 11 and 14. You can handle that. Sit up right, buckle your chin strap, let's go. <laughs> After this I looked, and there in heaven a door stood open. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and there in heaven stood a throne, with one seated on the throne. And the one seated there looks like jasper and carnelian. And around the throne is a rainbow that looks like an emerald. Around the throne are 24 thrones. And the seated on the thrones are 24 elders dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their heads. Coming from the throne are flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And in front of the throne burn seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God. And in front of the throne, there is something like a sea of glass, like crystal. Around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature is like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with a face like a human face, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and inside. Day and night without ceasing they sing, Holy, 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 the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall before the one who is seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, singing, You are worthy, our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. 
Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb, standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 leaders, elders fell before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice, worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing, to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. <clears throat> and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And from his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. Hallelujah. Amen. So there's a, a change in venue when we switch from vision one to vision two. We go from earth where the seven churches are to heaven. And in between, there is a door that opens and shuts. I want to just stop right there. You know, I think one of the biggest questions for human beings is, is there a heaven? Second biggest question, and how do you get there? <laughs> this says there is a heaven, and this says there is a door, so it's not inaccessible, but it is a door that opens and shuts. You know, Jesus at times said, you know, you can get shut out of the banquet, you can get shut out of the wedding. There are ways to get shut out, but there's a door, and it opens and shuts. How great it is that there is a door. It'd be terrible if there were no door. And it would be terrible if it was a door that was only shut. But this is the door that opens and shuts. Jesus said, I am the way. Other religious leaders advise us how to get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way to get to heaven. So there's a door. When it's open, go through it. Don't count on it being open forever and ever. Somebody could die on the way home from church today. Is that door open or shut? Step through while it's open. I've, under, I've heard that with uh, autism on that spectrum, that one of the issues is that everything is the same as it comes into perception. 
So a little piece of carpet over there has equal value to the attention as the communion table front and center. There is no front and center and everything is front and center if you get what I mean. That's not the case with the passage we read. What is front and center is a throne, a throne. Have you ever thought about the center of all life, all truth, all beauty, all love, all grace? There is an epicenter of it, and it is a throne, and a throne is a place of power and decision. There's a throne at the heart of life, and there's one who's seated on the throne. You see, it's, it's not the throne itself. You know, I could go to England, find the throne of England, and sit on it. Big deal. I'm not the king. <laughs> so it's an important note that there is one on the throne. And this one on the throne has all power and authority. Now, the Hebrews were particular about not having graven images. You've heard that, perhaps. The only authorized image of God is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is in the throne. And like we look at the sun, the solar sun, and don't look at it directly, but off to the side, we can note in the peripheral vision its brilliance. And so we look at the S-O-N in heaven the same way with that brilliance there. We go then from noting this throne, and this is really good news, that uh, everything isn't just up for grabs and chaos. There is a place of organization and strategy and love and power and design. What would it be like if we didn't know that that was the truth? But this is the reality. Now we move from the, the throne to 24 sub-thrones. And the 24 represents uh, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles of Jesus. It describes the Old Testament people of God, the New Testament people of God, or if you will, the Jewish people of God and the Gentile people of God. But they're all dressed in white, indicating purity and forgiveness, and they all have a crown, meaning there's authority to them. This may explain 1 Corinthians 6, 2, where Paul says, Don't you know that you will judge the earth and even the angels? There's a, an authority that Christians have. Now, when we move from throne to subthrone, then we have a sea. And a C does a number of things. You might think of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., how that reflection pond reflects the image and beautifies the image and amplifies the image. So there, there's a, a C in heaven that does that for the throne. Or you might think of, well, you know, if you put giant mirrors on every wall in your room, what happens? It gets bright, doesn't it? It feels larger. So we already have the large being enlarged. We already have the bright being more bright. You put it on the ceiling and the floor, and you can get multiple images. So there's a multiplication of this most glorious, beautiful image. Or maybe you want to go with just driving on Route 1 as the sun is coming up and how the Indian River just dances with a kajillion diamonds of light and what it does for you. It's kind of a, a red carpet to diamonds, not red, but diamond light that says where you're going is to someone significant. This is very, very important, but it is a sea. It's not a puddle. That means uh, there's a, a little distance. You don't just get to saunter up with no problem. Uh, to cross a sea, you, you, you've got to, one, get wet. That's one way. So you gotta get baptized. You gotta get washed. You have to be immersed in the blood of the lamb. You have to either be wet or you have to be in a ship like a discipleship, right? 
Jesus, Paul says, you are in Christ. You are in Christ. If you go to Fitzwilliam College, one of the 39 colleges of Cambridge University, there you'll go into the bottom floor, and as you look through those front doors, up, the ceiling is in the shape of the hull of a ship, like you're beneath the ship. And then you step up a staircase and you enter seating that makes it clear that you are in a ship. Noah survived because he was in a ship made and directed by God. And so if you want to get to that throne, you got to get wet, you got to get in a ship. So there's thrones, sub-thrones, and sea. We find out it's not just a vision, but it's an audition. It comes not just to our eyes, but also to our ears, because there is flash of light, and there is sounding sound. There's the emerald green rainbow, and there is the chorus, holy, holy, holy. There are indeed five choruses, speaking of choruses. So choir, you're gonna be right at home. You're gonna be practiced up. You're gonna be happy there with the five choruses, holy, holy, holy. And then our attention turns to four <coughs> creatures, living creatures. And they're all a little different, but they're all also a lot the same. Uh, the four would represent the four corners of the earth or the four seasons. Uh, those uh, faces on them correspond to the seasons. A uh, bull for spring and uh, lion for summer and eagle for winter and face of man, eagle for autumn, face of man for winter. And that would be telling us just something like I said with the stars. Stars are in outer space. So God is in all space, but there's also moon day and Saturn day and sun day, which indicates that all times are also in God's hands. So wherever you are and whenever you are, you are with the cosmic and close Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the one who is fire of truth, but also who has been in the furnace for us of judgment. Same way, in the four corners, all the earth, four seasons, all the time, there is this presence of God. Now, the way they're alike are the eyes. They're filled with eyes. Now, this can be a representation of how God sees everything. God sees everything. He sees you in the middle of the night, in the darkness. He sees you if you're hiding under your covers. He sees you. And this then shows symbolically, physically, that God, even his attendants are extensions of his all-seeing. The other thing I thought of was, you know, I've been a few places where the president was visiting and there's like an army of secret service agents and they're all training their eyes. You know. uh, I'm less inclined to think that it's uh, surveillance. God doesn't really need protecting, but it could be that there's a way that uh, you're not going to get by here with any falsehood as you try to proceed to God. The thing that catches me most is, well, have, have you ever said, you know, I need an extra set of hands? Anybody said that? Of course, everybody said that. And uh, has it ever, anybody ever sat down, rapped with attention for somebody and said, I'm all ears? And uh, has anybody ever sung the hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing? Why do you need a thousand? You already got one. Why do you need an extra set of hands? Why do you need to be all ears? You got two. What it's saying is, I just need more capacity. See, oh, for a thousand eyes to see the beauty and truth and love and glory of Jesus Christ. I wonder how many eyes we're going to have in our resurrected body. We certainly need and want to have that, that capacity to take in 
all the glory that is in heaven. The glory, the glory. So we go from the four living creatures and they're wanting to have a thousand eyes to sing. And we have this chorus that is making the uh, sound just almost per cusp. I, I was at the University of Illinois at Urbana one New Year's Eve with 17,000 other students and we were uh, singing as the midnight hour came and just the, the volume of 17,000 voices. It wasn't just hitting my eardrums, it was hitting my skin. And that's what we have. And so there's this uh, beauty engorged. I, I appreciate the little boy who said, you know, I'm not sure I'm ready to go to heaven. I said, why is that? He said, well, it sounds like a really long, long, long worship service. <laughs> I said, I'm with you, kid. But that's not this. This is something way more fun and superlative. In fact, what you want to do is you want to think of uh, the best brownie you've ever eaten, the best mountain you've ever climbed, the best sunset you've ever seen, the best sex you've ever had, the best fishing you've ever done, the uh, best uh, hallelujah chorus you've ever sung in. And you add all of that together, and it's 10,000 times more. Mary said, what I has not seen or heard. We can hardly imagine. I did notice when I said sex, two guys over here woke up. <laughs> and they turned to their wives and said, did you say sex? <laughs> you think that's funny? Four guys over here woke up and turned to their wives and said, did he say fishing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well... Daringly, we go into then chapter 5. And in, in chapter 5, it's, you know, my favorite Disney movie as a kid was The Sword and the Stone. <coughs> Who can pull the sword from the stone? And all these people tried, but nobody could do it, right? And there's a hero-like question. Who can open the scroll with a totality of seals? Who is able to open? And there seems to be a palpable sense of we need to have it open. We want to have it open. There's a desirous desire, a, a compelling need. And yet the answer is there's no one, no one who can open it. And the forlornness is just palpable. It's just palpable. But then, then there's this word. Hey, there is someone who can there's someone who can open it. Hallelujah, blessed news. Someone can open the door in heaven. Somebody can open the scrolls. And who is that? It's a lamb with a slit throat. Rich wounds yet visible above. That's what we see. Plunged beneath the flood, the blood. There's a river of life made of the blood of Jesus that flows from the throne. And this one, as he steps forth to grasp the scroll with its seals, the applause meter, the joy in the hearts that what was so necessarily needed and so desirously desired is finally going to come to pass. And the applause meter just is rupturing and there is wave upon wave from these myriad and thousand hosts of hosts, there is this praise and glory and this crescendo of amen. Fabulous. The heart of light, the heart of love, the heart of truth, the heart of beauty, the heart of glory, is Jesus Christ, a slaughtered lamb upon the throne. So what do we do with that? What do we walk away from this little tour of Revelation 4 and 5? What do we do? Well, one thing I think we do is we think about 
how great it is that there is a door to heaven, and that we ought to get through it while it's open. We ought to meet Jesus because he's the way. <coughs> a, a, a second thing is, you know, I, I'm not sure what kind of week you're going to have, but this is the first day of the week. I'm not sure what kind of year you're going to have, but this is the first month of the year. And I want to point out that we're going to go from 4 and 5 to 6 and 19, which is a lot of conflict and a lot of weirdness. But that conflict and weirdness is not tackled out of a frenetic defensiveness. It's an organized and beautiful confrontation. And we know that because we start with four and five. We are in the presence of God. And on Sunday morning before whatever transpires in the week, on January before whatever transpires in the year, you are savoring heaven. Heaven, you see, is not an afterthought. It's a forethought strategically that carries us forward. So when you're out at sea and it's getting rough, remember your port of destination. And who is at that port of destination? It's your captain, Jesus Christ, whose blood was poured out for you. And you know, I, I'm thinking... God did not, after the fact, walk around creation and go, oh, this would be a good symbol of heaven, and this would be a good symbol of heaven, brownies and hallelujah choruses. And... No. No. He made the world. He populated the world with all of these experiences so that they're like hors d'oeuvres for us, that we can savor them and through them be thinking of that port of destination and the one who made all of these gifts and made a gift of himself. I know you've done this, or if you haven't, you should. If you ever, if you ever get into tough sledding with your spouse, think about your honeymoon. Just say for it. Come, that was really nice. And you feel your heart softening towards your spouse. Yeah, that's what you want to do. Save for heaven and find your heart softening towards Jesus Christ and his ability to handle everything. Here's the truth. At the beginning of your days, the beginning of history, the end of days, the end of your days, and the middle of them, there is a center, and there is a throne, and that is good news, and especially good news, because the one on the throne is the Lamb of God who died for you and me. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Amen. Let us pray.